Well, thank you. And um, I'm very happy to be able to present here for Topsdesk C online event. So my name is Nancy Rademacher, and I will be talking about the X factor of customer centricity. And that is truly a survival strategy for the new normal. Now, everybody's been talking about this new normal um, for, for months, uh, so to speak. Um, but basically, I had been talking about the new normal because one of my business partners, Peter Hinson, had written a book about that new normal. And basically, the new normal is this day and age where we have moved from digital being a novelty to digital becoming the new norm. And if you are wondering if you maybe are from the old normal and don't really know, or maybe you are from the new normal, let me help you find out. So if you know the two objects um, displayed behind me, or know the relationship between these two objects, you're definitely old normal. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that, because so am I. But on the other hand, if you think that WhatsApp has this real weird icon, or if you think that the object below is a 3D printed version of the save icon of your application, then you're definitely new normal. Now, in these two worlds, they um, clash sometimes. And that's what happened just um, two weeks ago when my daughter was video calling my dad. And as you can see, this was a big clash because obviously he did not have a clue. Now, just um, with technology in this new normal, we have seen exponential evolution. We've seen this in computing power, exponential evolution in the amounts of data being collected, in the number of devices, and also in the market. That's there for um, artificial intelligence, for example. Now, just last year, leaders were asked if they saw significant disruption coming within the next three years. And about three quarters of them said yes. And that number had tripled in comparison with the year before. Now, the reasons for this disruption were mainly because of um, new technologies, new competition, and higher expectations with customers. But these days, of course, we can safely say that we can add the pandemic as a fourth cause of disruption. And in customer service, for example, companies are facing with um, surging ticket volumes, and uh, the requests are in the last few weeks at the highest level um, of this crisis, with an increase of 24% um, compared to last year. And of course, we can very well differentiate now between companies that were ready for this change and companies that were not. Now, as a human being in this new normal, we have gone through a number, a number of digital um, eras, so to speak. And right now, we find ourselves in the augmented age with AI at its core. And I used to say that we were on the cusp of entering the age of well-being. But I think the pandemic has truly accelerated this, and now we've entered the age of well-being at lightning speed. And this is about well-being in a physical sense, but also mental well-being, social well-being, and of course also financial well-being, and the well-being of the environment as well. Now, because we as humans have gone through all these eras, we have really changed. And I would like to call out the five-eye model of the changed human. There's five characteristics um, that we find ourselves faced with. Some of them are completely new and some have become more prominent because we have gone through this um, digital era. First of all, we've become much more informed. There's four and a half billion of us on the internet and more than five billion of us using a smartphone. And all of you at home are, of course, very much informed as well and making use of this internet as we speak. We've also become much more individualistic. Basically, we have literally put ourselves in the center of our very own universes. And companies need to deal with this aspect. We've also become very much impatient. In the 1970s, our span of attention was 10 to 12 seconds, but this has gone down to 7.6 seconds, which makes that we are now officially beaten by the goldfish that has a span of attention of eight seconds. And then we've also become much more intuitive. Now, what do I mean by that? Basically, our brain consists of two parts. We've got our rational brain 
and we've got our intuitive or emotional brain. Now, and although we consider ourselves, or most of us do, as rational human beings, we make our decisions mostly with our intuitive brain, at least 90% of it. We tend to justify rationally, but we make it with our emotional brain. And I think because we are so informed and we are so overloaded with information, we tend to revert to this intuitive brain a little more than we used to. And then finally, of course, we've also become much more influenced. Of all the internet users uh, worldwide, um, two and a half hours a day is being spent on social media. And these are numbers from January. I think they have gone up dramatically over the past few months. And in, the, in, the Western, in Western Europe, we are lagging a bit because in the East, it's almost up to four hours a day spent on social media. And so when you're dealing with customers, you have to take all these characteristics into account. And if you want to uh, move towards customer centricity, customer experience really comes first. And this is what my colleague Steven will be talking about when he's talking about the external customer. Because most of you in the audience, when you're speaking about your customer, will most often refer to an internal customer who basically is your fellow employee. So it's safe to say that you are in fact dealing with employee experience. And this has to be augmented to have more engaged employees. Now, if I were to ask you what a definition of employee experience is, I would probably get as many different answers as there would be many uh, people in the audience. Now, let me start by saying what it's not. It's not about employer branding and it's not about perks and benefits. Then what is it? Well, basically it's every single interaction an employee has with his organization. It's all these elements of work, so physical, emotional, intellectual, virtual, and even aspirational. And all of these need to be carefully orchestrated to engage your employees and to augment the experience. So if we go back to these five eyes, uh, we can turn them, each and every single one of them, into five different aspects that you can do in order to improve the employee experience. Um, first of all, because we are so informed, you clearly need to make things very transparent. And that could be on the status of my service request or the status of a technical rollout, but also from a leadership perspective on um, the reason why specific decisions are being made. Next to that, because we're so individualistic, it has to be personalized. You need a customized experience. And for your fellow employees, that might mean customized things so that they can do their jobs better. And then, of course, technology will enable you to bring more convenience and more speed. Well, that is if the technology gets adopted. And then finally, as humans, of course, you can evoke positive emotions with your fellow employees and truly help them being an internal ambassador. But to be honest, employee experience starts with culture. And culture has these two aspects on, uh, on it. It's first the intangible aspect of attitude. It's the beliefs and the ideas with people. And then secondly, it's the actions. So the behaviors displayed and the decisions that are being made. And there's many, many different definitions on culture because it is so crucially important. And that's why Walter will do a separate session um, later on on this particular aspect. Now, if we want to improve the employee experience, it, you should be designing this every single step of the way. So it is not just about recruitment or onboarding. It's every single experience an employee has with the organization throughout the life cycle of employment. And then when you design this employee experience, make sure that you take the right perspective. And mind you, this is where IT um, experts sometimes fail because they create an interface that they truly love and admire greatly, but they forget to take the perspective of the end user. And so you need to take that into account. Roughly when improving the employee experience and reviewing all of these interactions or touch points as I would call them, there are three categories where you can make major improvements. The first one being on the workplace and the organization. The second being on tools and technology, and that, of course, will greatly resonate with you. And then the final one is on leadership and communication. 
So let me start with the first one first. Um, the workplace is, of course, everything that um, employees sense. So it's the office building, the office space, all these days, the remote workspace. But next to that, it's also about the organization. The organizational structure will highly determine the employee experience. And so for every company, this is about designing your organization. There is no such thing as an ideal organizational structure. There is no copy and pasting um, either from one organization to another. You have to deal with your own organizational structure. What I would say, though, is that I think it is crucial that we start moving away from these traditional hierarchies where information tends to run very slowly, where you have teams working in silos and uh, command and control type of um, culture towards responsive networks where information can travel fast, sorry, where you have these global talent pools and where you have a much more uh, coaching, enabling, learning and adapting kind of culture. It's all about collaboration basically and enabling this. And although most leaders say, uh, in fact, 85% say that collaboration is very much okay within their organization, only 41% of employees actually agree. Now, the next category, as I said, is about tools and technology, and that will greatly resonate with you, I think. Now, and because we are finding ourselves in this augmented age with AI at its core, of course, big data um, and artificial intelligence are very, very important here. The big data are what fuels the algorithms created uh, with the help of artificial intelligence. And as consumers, we are already influenced big time by algorithms. They influence who we talk and listen to, what kind of music we listen to, what kind of movies we watch, and they even tried to influence our voting uh, behavior. And in any type of business, in any sector and in any aspect of business, you can also use um, artificial intelligence and algorithms to make predictions. So just a couple of examples uh, here. Um, Amazon has a supply chain optimization team that uses uh, algorithms to predict demand. Not just the type of product, but also the color and the size. And by doing these predictions, that will enable them to move these objects to the right warehouse and the right part within the warehouse so that they can deliver on promise when it comes down to delivery times. And then algorithms also help us to get what we call predictive maintenance. By using sensors and smart algorithms, machines, so to speak, alert us when they are about to break down and need to be serviced. And then in customer service, algorithms can help us with automated routing based on people's activity on the website. Suppose, for example, that I'm on a website of a bank and I want to do some investments and I scroll and drill down and then I get stuck somewhere and then I call the bank for some help. If the algorithm is used right, <laughs> then I will be transferred automatically, automatically routed to the right customer service representative. It also enables us, these algorithms, to predict someone's personality based on their activity on social channels. This is an example of an app called Crystal Nose, and it's based on what someone does on LinkedIn. And by doing that, you can find out what someone's personality is, and it is with great accuracy, scary accuracy, I must say. And you can find how you relate to this person. So in this second rectangle, you find out more about my personality. It's these yellow um, circles. And that's great if you want to decide on the tone of communication that you want to have with someone that you are emailing or calling for the very first time. And then in service, of course, I think the major thing that's going to happen within the next one or two years is voice. Already voice search and voice commands um, are growing as we speak. Um, in, the, in the world, you see that 46% of all global users use voice commands. Again, in Western Europe, we are um, greatly lagging there, but I think it is the opportunity for the future. And to be honest, um, 43% of all consumers and 62% of the millennials are very happy with their customer service interactions being taken care of by these intelligence home-based applications such as the Amazon um, Echo and the Google Home. And so the question of 10 years ago, should we build a mobile app, has now become, should we build a voice app? 
And I think the answer to that should, of course, be yes. Now, in this era, um, with all of this technology, what is it about in organization? In my view, it's about these three things. It's about leveraging the data, leveraging technologies, and adopting new ways of working. And these three components, in fact, make up the definition of digital transformation. And it is truly about adopting these new ways of working. Today, in the midst of the crisis, I think digital transformation has been, or is being valued much more highly than it was before. And what I see happening is that we really need to adopt a new way of working. Remember, I talked in the beginning about remote education. If you do that, it's not merely doing digitally what you used to do in front of a physical classroom. You have to think of new ways to transfer knowledge and to have a learning experience that is very exciting and challenging to your, uh, your students. And basically, that's what you see happening in every job there. Because of digital transformation, the type of job changes as well. And that's what you need to deal with. Now, what does it enable us to do? So from this technology perspective, it enables organizations to become much more resilient, which is, of course, very important in these times. But that is only if the technology is robust at the same time. And so companies that are able to make investments in digital business instead of merely on daily operations, and that can shift their technology capacity and their investments to, for example, digital platforms, will be more resilient and will be able to keep their organization running smoothly, even in the long term. But it's not just about resilience. It is also about agility. If your technology is flexible and allows you for maximum flexibility, you will become agile as an organization, which um, ensures competitiveness because it means that you are able to adapt to changing circumstances, but also to adapt to changing customer behavior. And then, you know, with digital transformation, a lot of people are kind of scared and they view it as a, a battle between man and machine. In my view, it is not man versus machine, it is man with machine. It is not um, about us having to lose our jobs, we are not um, made redundant, we are basically being promoted. And I think the right combination of people and technology will not create perfection, but it will enable us both to, um, to become better in the end. And so instead of artificial intelligence, um, it's basically about intelligence amplification. And that's what Satya Nadella from Microsoft said as well. It is about intelligent technology amplified by human ingenuity or vice versa. I think both will, will do. And that means if you are on this transformational path, it is not only about digital, but it is about human or cultural at the very same time. So it's um, basically not just a transformation on your technology, but transformation on your employees um, as well. And now, traditionally in companies where they had digital in place, this was mostly focused on the customer. They wanted a 360 view of the customer, and I think most companies have reached that um, already. But I think equal investment should be made into reaching a 360 view of your employees as well not just with regards to the static data, but also with regards to the more experiential ones um, at the same time. And then technology can also be used, um, for example, in these, in these apps behind me, to um, do performance management, to uh, be able to provide feedback, to enable collaboration, and to augment engagement. But as I said, it's also about well-being. And so there's numerous apps out there that will enable you to do that as well. So um, mindfulness apps, apps for physical activity, brain activity, and even apps for nap taking. And then artificial intelligence can be used in this space as well. We can make all kinds of predictions with relevance to our employees. Um, there's two examples that I want to call out here. Now, the first one is called Vibe. And this is an app that will enable you to, based on the public communication channel of uh, a tool like, for example, Slack, um, to feel the temperature of your organization. 
it will look for certain emojis and keywords and phrases to find out what the general sentiment is of the teams. And another tool called Keen does exactly the same thing, but then based on emails. So they will go through all of the emails, mind you, not to read the content, but to look for certain keywords and phrases again, and then make an aggregation per team so that you can feel what the temperature of each and every team is on a daily basis, and not just based on a yearly employee survey. And then finally, the third category where uh, improvements can be made on em employee experience is leadership and communication. And I think these days it should be about empathetic leadership. Because your employees may be facing health conditions within their families or themselves, they may be facing uncertainty about their jobs or uneasiness with having to work remotely. But I think empathetic leadership should be about empathy with rolled up sleeves. So it's not just putting your arm around someone's shoulder, it's actually standing beside someone, ask them what can we do together so to achieve what is necessary. And three things are very important here with respect to leadership, and that's transparency, empowerment, and space. Because you have, if you have maximum transparency, that will create, at first, trust. If you are very transparent about your mission and about the goals of your organization, um, you, will, you will gain trust. If you provide your employees with all the information they need, and if they know clearly what the goals are that they have to achieve, so if you communicate clearly about these, there will be no inefficiencies or slowdowns because of indecisiveness, and that will create more efficiency. And then finally, if you are transparent about results, not just the company's results, but also about team results or individual results, you will create more peer accountability. And then, of course, if you um, empower your employees, give them more autonomy, automatically they will take more ownership and they will become much more engaged. And then finally, I think it's also about creating space. Not just physical space, but also some headspace. And it needs to be psychologically safe as well. Innovation will basically take place when people dare to take risks without being afraid of any repercussions. So it's these three categories that I think will greatly improve the employee experience. And in the end, if all these are taken into account, you will have a 4E employee who is um, enabled, empowered, energized, and engaged. And these 4E employees is what you can influence through your IT and they will then move on to create these wonderful experiences on the outside. Because basically that is my mission, that by augmenting the employee experience, you will have more engaged employees who will in turn create better customer experiences leading to highly engaged customers, which of course will drive the economic value of your organization. So where customer experience, what Steven will be talking about, um, is more about your brand, employee experience is much more about culture. And if you want to do this right, there needs to be a marriage of the two in order to achieve what I call good sex. And that is where they see, mind you, and it stands for customer and employee experience. In the end, it is all about creating this wow experience for your fellow employees, your internal customers, and for the external customers as well. And I would like to end my talk with a lovely quote by Maya Angelou. It's from the old normal, but it's still very relevant these days and will continue to be, I'm sure, the, the years to come. And it goes like this. Sometimes people forget what you said or what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much for listening to my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. Nancy is actually going to join me here at the table. Uh, and I was supposed to talk, for, talk with her for another five minutes, but unfortunately, I spent too much time chit-chatting with Renske in the introduction. So um, we only have time for one question from the audience, but uh, it was very interesting. I actually learned a lot from you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, Renske, 
you, you have the opportunity to choose one question from the audience. I will tell you though that um, Nancy is going to be here also the next hour. And then we have another guest, but they will be a very good team together. So you can still ask her questions. But for now, before the break, just one. Renske. Yeah, I have a question from somebody from the audience. Um, it's from uh, Dave Schutz from uh, Boscalis, and he's very curious to hear from you what the difference is between employee experience and customer centricity. Uh, where do you see the differences between focusing on employees and focusing on customers? Okay. Well, to be honest, I think um, to, in order to become a customer-centric organization, you need to do both. Hmm. So um, when I talked about the good sex at the end, what I meant basically is to become a customer-centric organization, you need to equally focus on customer experience and employee experience. Basically, creating value out of digital transformation starts on the inside. So you, hmm. you, in my view, you start with employees. And I think it's Top Desk's motto as well, happy employees create happy customers. And this is crucial for being a customer-centric organization. Yeah, so if they're happy, they show a happy face to your customers and then your customers are happy Yeah, that's well. how it works. Yeah, I'm gonna look to Richard. Richard's my, my chief right now. Can I do one more question or, nah? Can, sorry. Um, okay, we're gonna do a little break. I'm very sorry, but we'll, we'll talk to you later. Um, after the break, we will be joined by another speaker, speaker Stephen van Belleghem. He's actually a colleague of Nancy. And he will be talking about the digital transformation of the past few months and how that has affected us and our company. So stay tuned, see you in a bit. Welcome back everybody. It was a very short break, so I hope you managed to get a cup of coffee or something else, maybe a beer, depending on your time of the day. Um, in the next hour, we'll be joined by Steven van Belleghem and our panel of experts. This is Top Desk C Online 2020. So in the previous hour we had a presentation by Nancy Rademaker and we've heard about digital transformation in general. Now next we want to find out what this transformation implies for our day-to-day -day work. Which habits have changed, uh, what do you miss and what did you gain? So I would like to do another poll to see what you all think. Uh, again, if you uh, haven't opened um, the interactive tool, you go to, oh, I, have to I have to know this out of my head, but I don't know. Uh, I think it's topdeskc.joinlive.tv. Thank you very much. Um, and you go there and you go to the live tab. It's the second tab and then you can see the poll. And the question is, which habits do you want to keep? Maybe no more commuting, flexible working hours, casual Friday every day, or you love the focus time. I mean, you don't have any distractions from your colleagues. So I'm curious what you think. How about you, Nancy? What would you like to keep? Well, to be very honest, I would like to keep none of these. Um, so Nothing? Uh, no, I did like um, the first few months being at home and now I'm kind of fed up with it. So I would like to go outside much more and I would love to, for things <laughs> to get back to Let's say old normal. <laughs> okay, yeah, but obviously you're a keynote speaker, so you like to be yes. outside in the audience. And I find that I love traveling, so um, I would love to do that again. So even more commuting for you. Yes. <laughs> um, do we have the answer of the poll yet? Yes, we do. Okay, so most people answer the flexible working hours. Yeah, I can definitely agree with that. That is awesome. Uh, having some time for breakfast. No more commuting. Okay, so no more commuting and focus time are good things. And the casual Friday every day is not very popular. That surprises me. Interesting. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, you can actually join us at the table. Nancy is still here. Yes. It's funny, I, I see the audience uh, in a split screen and I see people nodding when you were talking. Oh, it's like, uh, <laughs> first, nay, uh, people first, then the planet, and they were like, yeah. <laughs> That's really funny. I didn't expect anyone um, 
to get me excited about going to shopping and Walmart or Achmea, it's, uh, <laughs> that's quite a talent. Work, yeah. <laughs> no, I am excited to go to Walmart, but I don't know when, because we don't have that here, right? That's true. Yeah. Um, so we actually, uh, we have some uh, extra minutes to discuss some uh, audience questions with you. Um, first question I had for you uh, is because you work together and you talk more, talk more about the customer experience, you talk more about the employee experience. Do you think there are any important differences or are those two ever fighting with each other or is it always a good team work? Well, I think there's no one before the other. I think both of them are equally important. I think maybe you stress the customer a bit more and I, I, I do both, but mm. I think you can't have a good customer experience if you don't focus on the employee experience and maybe vice versa as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, You agree? Yeah, well, there, there's a lot of research about it. And sometimes I get a question afterwards, people saying, yeah, okay, customer is really important, but how about Amazon? We hear all these horror stories about unhappy employees, yeah. and still the customers are very happy. So what you see, there are a few exceptions of companies that have happy customers but unhappy employees. That can happen. But the other direction is more interesting. Huh? That's what Nancy talks about. If you have a great employee experience, mm -hmm. there's almost a 100% certainty that your customers will also be happy. The other way around, it doesn't work like this, but happy employees breed happy customers. That, that, that is what every piece of research is yeah. saying. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, interesting. Um, I have uh, one question t for you, uh, Stephen. Okay. Because um, you work in a lot of different continents, right? Yeah. So are, they, are there important cultural differences between customer experience or what people want? Absolutely, absolutely. I think that the most exciting place to go to is, uh, is the East right now. Yeah. Uh, not just China, but also Korea, Singapore. They are so far ahead in terms of digital that, um, that it becomes really exciting. Eh? It's the, like Nancy mentioned, they spend twice as much time on their phone. That's not just to have fun, but that's also because social media is like a digital shopping mall in China and Singapore. Uh, and they're, they're okay with that. That's, that's their way of life. Eh? We're like more, okay, we need to talk more together. There you see that less happening. I think um, what, what's also an interesting continent is Africa, actually. I had the pleasure to speak in uh, Tanzania for Vodafone. Mm -hmm. And they invented M-Pesa in, uh, in Tanzania. And M-Pesa is a mobile wallet. They mm -hmm. created that like almost 10 years ago because many people in Tanzania don't have a bank account because there is no bank or yeah. they don't make enough money. Uh, and they had cash, which was really dangerous. So they created a mobile wallet that you can use on an old Nokia. Yeah. And now 80% of all payments in Tanzania and Kenya are made through mobile phones, more wow. than in Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, United States. That's so interesting. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. It's actually like they skip certain steps that we made, yeah. like we don't need those steps anymore, they're old school and we go, we yeah, go we, to the we, digital transformation. I, I, was in, I was in Africa last year on vacation and I, I was in Madagascar and it's one of the poorest countries in the world and actually you have the, uh, the huts where people live and they live in very poor uh, situations but they do have one of them dedicated to to this m mobile platform. So they have a mobile phone and they do everything? They do, yeah, it. they do. You know, the, the, well, first generation type, but they do have mobile phones. Yeah. Even if they live in such, you know, yeah. primitive uh, circumstances. Yeah, yeah. It's much more affordable also than a, than a laptop. I'm looking at Renske. Are we, do we have any questions from the audience? I guess so, right? Yeah, there are some questions coming up. Um, before we go to that, I also have a question actually to you, Nancy. Um, you heard the story of, of Stephen. Uh, do you recognize that story also from an employee experience perspective? Do you, is there a similarity there? Well, I think if you, if you think about um, ethical value, what you know, consumers are more and more looking for with organizations, I think the same goes for, um, for customers. So, um, oh, sorry, for employees. Um, it has now, so the, the shift of power has moved to the customer in, in the consumer's world, but I think it's also moved to the employee in, in the working world. So it's not just um, companies deciding who can work for us, but it's actually they have to convince future employees, please come work for my company. Right. So I think there's a shift in power there as well. And as I mentioned that people are so influenced, we look for reviews when we go out to travel. I think if you look at, for example, Glassdoor, which is like the trip advisor 
advisor for, for organizations, we tend to look at reviews before we uh, apply for a job at a certain uh, organization. And I think having these strong values within your company is absolutely crucial to get people to come work for you. So yes, I do think that similarities are, are, are big. And also maybe like the image of a company is more important, right? Like are you, yeah. Yeah, but you have to keep in mind that basically we've moved from companies being these black boxes right. to companies being becoming these glass boxes right. where everybody can see. Everything has become visible to the outside world. So if you have a good image, which to me sounds a bit like, you know, you create a brand, uh, and you, you do some employer branding, that's not what's going to, to make it work. It's about what people actually experience on the work floor and how they talk to the, about this on, on social media, for instance, that will become crucially important. Good. Yeah. Do you Thank have you. another question? Yeah, we actually we have a question also from, from somebody via Zoom. So, oh, it's a uh, tone. Let's, let's see a cat. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there we are, hello. Can I get you on the other queue as well? No, we can't. Hi. Who are you and how are you? Hi there. Uh, my name is Stone, and I'm working at Postanel uh, in the Netherlands. And of course, I'm using uh, TopDesk in a lot of our processes at work. Um, and therefore, I had a question to you, Stephen. Yeah. Uh, okay. Namely, because we were talking about customer satisfaction and trade-offs, but uh, whenever we uh, try to have uh, communication with our customers, on the one side we have humans, and on the other hand we have AI and robots. And do we ever uh, gonna get the AI and robots good enough so we can fool the customers? <laughs> they are thinking to humans. Yeah, yeah, good question. Very I'm going to quickly repeat the question because okay. I'm not sure if everybody yeah. heard it. Um, so the question is, is AI ever going to be so good that it will actually fool us uh, for being human? Yeah, I think the answer is very simple to that. Yes, it's going to be as good. The only question is, when will that happen? Uh, I think Nancy talked about voice assistants. I love those things. I have them in my house, but they're very creepy as well. <laughs> Um, yeah. Sometimes they start to talk and then I'm like, shut up because I didn't ask you something. Shut up, creep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's, it's very creepy sometimes. So I have the feeling that we're still in the Blackberry before the iPhone phase. Right. In terms of voice and, and AI, uh, especially with written bots. I mean, there's n it's not that perfect yet. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to wait for the iPhone moment in, in AI before that actually happens. Mm -hmm. No idea when. But I'm convinced that at a certain point, we will get there. The, the most fascinating one that I've seen so far is, um, but I forgot the name, it's Google... Duplex. Duplex, thank yeah. you. Google Duplex, <laughs> okay. where you can just say, hey, Google, call my hairdresser and make an appointment. And then it's a voice call. You can hear that it's a computer. But it's a voice call that's pretty good to make an appointment. So, that's so the we'll most fool your hairdresser. Yeah, but actually, yeah. actually what they've done now is when they, they, when they use Google Duplex, it has learned so much that when it calls, uh, for example, your hairdresser, now they have to um, tell the uh, organization they're calling first that they are oh. actually a voice bot. Yeah. Yeah. Because people, so that's how good it's become. People yeah. believe that it was an actual human. Wow, yeah. that's super interesting. It's very functional, like calling to a hairdresser and saying I want an appointment, does nine o'clock work? No, 10 o'clock. I would love that, that. That's a simple conversation. They're pretty close to that. The more complex things, very yeah. far away from it. Yeah. I want a senior hairdresser or junior. Yeah. Yeah, I want the cheapest one, yeah. <laughs> but if I, if I heard your uh, uh, presentation, then it sounded like, well, the best combination is when we're a team, when we have artificial intelligence doing one thing, what they're good at, and people are doing what they are best at. Yeah. Yeah. So don't you think that it's always going to be like that? I'm convinced it's going to be like that. Um, and, and it depends on the context. Like, let's take the insurance industry. I, I talked about that. I think in 95% of the cases, when I have a claim or an issue, I just want to have fast and easy. Hmm. I don't want a human because it's a waste of time. Are you really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a waste of time. Ah. It's too slow. But in 5% of the cases, when someone dies, when your house burns down, when you really have a bad accident, when someone is really ill, when it becomes really emotional. I really, that's hope, I really hope that's not 5%, though. All those horrible scenarios. No, I'm kidding. No, I hope so, too. <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? When something really emotional happens, yeah. you really want to have a human. Yeah. Even if a machine is really good, that's the moment that you want to cry on the shoulder yeah. and feel the empathy. Yeah. 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 
Thanks. Uh, I think I'm going to have to introduce my panel. Yeah, I almost forgot. No, I didn't forget you. Because, um, uh, yeah, there's so much to talk about with you guys, but I actually have a very uh, a special panel here. Uh, maybe you can introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Martin, Business Unit Director from Global Accounts within Topdesk. Wow, that was really fast. Sorry. Is that, is it, you, can you do that again? Just of course tiny I can. Bit, uh, my name is uh, Martin, uh, Business Unit uh, Director within uh, Topdesk, uh, Global Accounts in this case. Uh, I'm a member of some teams that are very passionate about what the stuff uh, you guys uh, are talking about as well. Yeah, you were smiling all the time. I Absolutely, saw yes. Yeah. <laughs> can't, can't wait for that era. <laughs> okay, thank you, Martin. And next to you is Rick. Yes, I'll uh, try to do it a bit slower. Sorry. Uh, my name is Rick van Berendonk. I'm the CTO of OGD uh, ICT Diensten. Let's yeah. say that a little bit Dutch uh, English. Uh, so we're an IT service provider, and as the CTO, I oversee a lot of the technical developments we're doing. So the presentation was also for me preaching to the choir. <laughs> <laughs> You're both very excited. Yep. Yeah, and then uh, our, next, our, our next panel member is actually uh, here on video. I hope you can all see her. Her name is Esther. Hi, Esther. Hi. Hi. You were having a call today, right? You didn't want to uh, affect us <laughs> with the virus. <laughs> yeah, no, we have to play it safe. Yeah, it's very strange. It's, it's probably just a normal cold, what I know uh, within 48 hours. <laughs> no, yeah, no, but that's but, uh, fine. Yeah, I didn't want to take any chances. So, uh, yeah, but my name is Esther Rulops. I'm a workplace consultant at Workwire. Um, very excited about what I'm hearing uh, because we are actually more focusing on uh, the physical uh, components, so the physical work environment and the whole interaction with ICT, uh, digital transformation and behavior. So, really so within the panel, you're the most human touch expert. They say, they say. They say. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's good. Hey, so um, uh, before we uh, go to more questions, I actually want to do another poll with the audience. Um, so, question to the audience: You can go again, go to topdeskc.joinlive.tv, uh, and you click on the second tab, which says live, and then you get a question. And the question is: What's your single greatest work-related concern right now? It's an open question, so you can answer in a word cloud. You can just type in any question you want. Uh, and we'll get a beautiful result here. Um, maybe I, I can ask that question to you, Stephen. What's your single greatest work-related concern right now? Um, to be honest, it, it evolved with me because um, I, I do a lot of speaking internationally and, and the first few weeks that this whole thing started, my agenda evolved from being full to completely empty. I was panicking. I thought this is the end of my life as I know it. <laughs> um, yeah, seriously, I was really afraid. That, that was my biggest concern. Will, will I still have a job in the next 18 to 24 months? Yeah. Um, but then it quickly evolved. I was really uh, surprised how fast companies made that switch to these kind of events, events virtual events. And, and now I have a, a full agenda and, and I'm doing a lot of Great, great things. Um, my biggest concern is still how long will this whole situation last? Because I also miss the the offline world. I miss yeah. traveling. That's personally from my point of view. So, so I hope that we're going to have things under control to uh, to evolve that. So, in in my profession, that's my biggest concern. Yeah. I understand that. I actually saw the result of the poll here. Uh, it looked a little bit confusing to me. I don't know. <laughs> I see time. Uh, continuity, work-life balance, communication, employees, connection. Wow, a uh, lot of different words. It's work-life balance, coffee talks. Yeah, I can imagine. Coffee talks, I'm, I'm missing that as well. Uh, motivation. motivation. Yeah, motivation. Yeah, finding your motivation if you're if at you, home. Um, yeah, if you don't have colleagues. For seven days of the week. Yeah. It's probably something that people are struggling with. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. Vision. Yeah, it's a bit about a little bit the same, right? Well, yeah. If if you know, when will it be over? That's I think the uncertainty is what is getting to people. So research yeah. has shown that mental health is under great pressure these days. It's something that's not to be underestimated by by a lot of yeah. organizations. Actually, the human facts are meeting people, getting inspired, having vision. Yeah. Um, uh, Renska, I think we have uh, we have questions from the audience for our either our panel or. My experts here. Um, let me see. Not yet. Oh well, well yeah. I see one more question um, in line with the previous uh, question in the poll. 
Um, like Stephen, what is your uh, new habits that you want to continue? <laughs> Well, I have, I have personal new habits and professional new habits. The, the, the one that I would really like to keep is uh, the fact that I have time for my daily walk now. I, my wife thinks I'm crazy, but every day at 5.50, I put my alarm clock, and at 6 o'clock, I'm, I'm out, and then I do a walk of 10 to, to 16 kilometers. This morning, I did about 10 because I had to come over here. And it, it really energizes me, and I, I love doing that. So I hope that I will still have time to, to do that. That's private. Professionally, um, I really hope that um, I, can, I can go to live audiences again. We have six people here, and this is the largest audience in, in three months, so it's really, <laughs> really exciting. Um, but on the other hand, Renske, I also hope that, I, that we're going to keep some of these virtual events because in a normal year, my family doesn't see me during the week. I never have dinner between Monday and Friday together. Now we have that every day, and I really enjoy that. So I hope that we will be able to keep that and you know, have a more uh, hybrid life for myself as well, where I can see beautiful people all over the world, but where I also have more time for my family. That would be my ideal outcome um, afterwards. Yeah. Cool. That sounds good. Yeah, because actually I think what we'd like to talk about next is how we can profit from this crisis. Like, there's a lot of problems people are facing, everybody has his own problems, things we miss, but the question is, I think, how do we get the best out of it? Never waste a good crisis, right? I think with regards to digital, we have always had this extreme resistance to change within organizations and, and probably with, with customers as well. And I think because, you know, what I said, what sometimes took months or even years has now come about in just a few weeks' time. And yeah. I think pe because people had to, they did. And I think this is something that we're not going to lose um, again. No. So I think that's, that's a good thing um, from, that we take from this crisis. I hope, I hope. I'm going to focus on my panel uh, briefly, because um, Rick, uh, well, I guess you, you speak to a lot of different people. Um, what do you think, if you saw this whole uh, uh, word cloud of yeah, problems that people are facing, what do you feel is the biggest challenge that you see today around the people you work with? I noticed the word time in the middle. Yeah. It was time. Yeah. I can really relate to that. I see people having struggles with uh, working at home and balancing the work that still needs to be done. Uh, but also, uh, of course, here in the Netherlands, we have, we have had for like two months, uh, the children couldn't go to school. The schools yeah. were closed, the daycare was closed, er uh, everything was closed. So the roles of parent, of husband, wife, but also worker, they really intertwined and it really made it hard for a lot of people. Uh, I spoke to uh, both my colleagues, but also my, my, uh, my uh, customers, my clients, yeah. to really manage that, to manage their time, to balance their time, still being able to do your work, but also doing all these other tasks that suddenly changed all of a sudden. So I'm, I can really relate to the time issue. And, and do you feel that people are getting better at it when they're, yeah, like Absolutely. over the past few months, do you see any progression? I see a lot of progression uh, on the one end because the schools are back open. Uh, so that helps a lot <laughs> yeah. really for parents. I mean, they're, re they're really like, ah, now I can really focus. And that's the other t thing. Um, one of the questions was, what would you like to take, take with you uh, going forward after this crisis? Uh, for me and for a lot of people is the focus. Um, I mean, now that the kids are back to school again, uh, you're working from home, you don't have the distraction of your colleagues, so the really focused time, yeah. I think that's really a, a very good thing that will stay with, with us. Um, that also uh, brings me to what I miss the most and what I see my customers uh, also saying. Uh, what they miss is really the interaction, the human interaction. There's nothing like really looking a person into the eyes, getting yeah. the energy uh, when you're doing a session, whiteboarding and everything. That's really re what I miss. Yeah, vision, motivation, that's two of the words that we saw there, yeah. So actually, people are going to sort of a digital transformation at home. You're building your, your office at home. I feel, I feel like that, which, which makes it psychologically uh, difficult to actually split your private life with... Uh, um, yeah, your working life. Um, so then a question from Martin. Um, Martin, what do you think that organizations should do to get ahead with the digital transformation? Oof, that's a, diff a difficult one. Yeah, we, we uh, saved that one for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks for that one. Um, many people know me that I'm more forward thinking, like uh, Steve already mentioned a few topics and so on. And what I see is the, the, the I don't call it really a battle, but it's always uh, the char characteristics of people that some are more risk averse and some like the change. 
Um, the COVID crisis made everybody aware that we need to change. Uh, big projects like implementing MS Teams in normally a year could be done within a month, like you said, uh, Nancy. And the big challenge is, is to keep that pace. Yeah. Um, so when this is getting back to normal and normal, um, how can we keep that pace and how can we get, keep the change? Right. I think Esther wants to say something about it. I saw, yeah, I saw her finger. <laughs> Esther, what tell me. Well, it's, it's, it's very, yeah, we, we, we hear uh, a lot of the same things at our clients. Um, I think that they are mainly focused now on how can we keep the good habits while everybody is slowly getting back into the office. And because what you see is the whole digital transformation, it had a huge push. So um, I think that it's going pretty well and experiences are good with it. But then if we look at the physical work environment and the situation, it's, I guess you could say it's lagging behind a bit and um, you see that a lot of clients don't really know how to deal with it. So how can we make sure that the physical work environment that everybody is returning to, that it really breathes um, uh, the way that we are working now and that it can be um, in a way a sort of a nudge uh, to remind people that we are working in a different way and to prevent people getting back into the office to fall back into old habits. So, um, can, you, can you give one short example of what you mean? Because I, I, I sort of get it, but it's still a little fake. Yeah, well, we, we, we actually developed a, a mixed presence office uh, concept and it has a lot to do with um, a new focus on ergonomics. Uh, so to prevent people from staring all day into the lens, into the laptop, it's, it's, it's very bad for your posture. So making sure that the environment has a lot of opportunities for different postures, uh, uh, different seating arrangements, but also the facilities to what we are doing right here, having a mixed presence uh, meeting. So being able to shift uh, easily to the people at the table and people calling in and making sure that that is all they're really supporting uh, uh, the activity of the moment. So um, that's very important. But uh, yeah, I can give a lot of other examples. Oh, I. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, we'll, we'll get to that later. Uh, but thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I want to do one more quick uh, poll with the audience before we go uh, to another answers of you. Um, and the poll is again at topdeskc.joinlive.tv in the second tab, which says live. And the question is, how did the COVID-19 crisis affect your organization? And you can answer with like, uh, for instance, all employees uh, could just continue working remotely, nothing changed, or you had to make some adjustments, or maybe some new tools or new ways of working were implemented, um, or maybe you had to change your entire way of working. Um, so we're curious how that went for you. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask that to my panel because I know from you, your keynote speakers, uh, all events have been cancelled. <laughs> yeah. You had all the time to come here. Um, but how about my panel? How, how much, what changed for you? Uh, well, I can say for my own company, OGD, we were already very much used to working uh, from home. So for us, it didn't, well, it went, we, it, it went pretty smoothly. Um, thinking about our clients, um, I think Almost all of our clients did some degree of working at home, but it was it wasn't it was absolutely nothing like this. It was really there's the technical option to work from home. Right. So there's like a small farm of servers hosting that bit of technology to make that possible. Um, and there were some people that are already working more in the cloud, which is re really more location independent. Uh, those companies really had, or like in two months, they had a big, huge step forward for it, and really going through. Uh, well, expanding that and, uh, well, they were actually uh, all, the most of them were able to really make that transition. Okay. Well, because I see the answers now, um, most people answer with all employees could continue working remotely. But that's only 40%, so uh, some had to make some adjustments, some had to implement some new tools, and, uh, well, just 6% had to change the entire way of working. Which is actually good, but it sounds to me like most people do, I mean, you might say they sort of profited from this fast change, right? You have to change a lot of ways of working, but if you see, if you look forward to the digital transformation, that sounds positive, right? 
I think you could hear in, uh, in the news as well that <clears throat> excuse me, some companies um, really took advantage of this, and in a good sense that is, so that instead of going to the client's office, they could do things remotely and they could save time and you, you didn't need to go by car, you would save um, gas and stuff so it would be better for, for the world. So you've, you could, you've got all these benefits combined, so to speak, so I think that's good. So there is something positive about this time. Well, we're going to take a short break and we'll be back in a few minutes with the breakout sessions where you can continue the discussion in small groups. We'll see you in a bit. <laughs> 